Well, and we're... that is fine. Yeah, we're, we're on mute. Great. <laughs> Okay, um, we're going to jump in and kick things off. Uh, welcome to this week's Zoom call on coronavirus and the arts and cultural sector, hosted by The World Transformed and Momentum. We're planning on running these calls every Tuesday evening, although usually at 8pm. Uh, they will, uh, at the new time, today it's at the new time of 6.30 to 8pm for the duration of Ramadan. So remember to keep Tuesday evenings free and tune in. We currently have... Just checking how many participants. Can't tell. Oh, there, look. 170. Wow, that's amazing. Um, we current, yeah, 170 people on the call already and more on Facebook, which is really amazing. Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Nora. I'm an actor and a member of Equity and helped with the coordination of the theatre um, at last year's TWT Festival. Uh, and my name's Sam, also an actor. I sit on Equity's Young Members Committee. Uh, and I also helped coordinate the theatre at last year's festival. Uh, welcome to our living room. Uh, we're going to be hosting the call from uh, here tonight. Hope you're all doing really good. Um, so yeah, just to get on with things, basically coronavirus has exposed the deep inequalities of wealth and power in our society, and the art sector is no exception to that. Since the lockdown, the art sector has suffered from an immediate shutdown. Theatres, art galleries, music venues have closed and the cancellation of festivals, concerts, community art projects leave the sector in an indeterminate limbo, fighting against long-term long closure. Many crowdfunders and campaigns have been set up in order to protect cultural sites, uh, which may never reopen after lockdown. Um, we're going to post uh, a couple of links to some of those crowdfunders just in the chat now as well. So yeah, cheers, Dan. Rife with inequalities through mass privatization, an increase uh, reliance on corporate funding and a diminishing welfare state has meant that access to the arts as both a participant and a maker has been increasingly difficult, particularly for working class, disabled and artists of color. It is this specific economy of unequal distribution in the arts that makes the effects of coronavirus so severe. The current crisis reveals the inherent precariousness that the art sector is built upon and the limitations in access to funding and representation that public institutions have been unable to challenge and overcome. Even with a 160 million injection of funds into the Arts Council England, access is still unbalanced and will not absorb catastrophic effects of live event cancellations and insufficient state financial support for freelance workers. So we need to develop strategies of solidarity across the sector to recognize the social value of the creative industries and allow culture to flourish in our local communities, not just in the metropolitan areas. We believe that within socialist response to COVID-19, that art should be integrated into our fights and bring creative forms of protests and analysis to how the crisis deepens economic and social inequalities. The arts rely on the gathering of people to come together and share or consume artistic content and is often a much needed source of collective joy, something that I think we're all craving at the moment. So much more content is being transferred to digital platforms right now. On the one hand, creating a more egalitarian access to arts and culture, but on the other hand, it creates even greater barriers to paying artists as we consume more and more culture for free, often relying on the larger conglomerates of cultural productions such as Netflix, provoking the question of how access to arts is skewered by profit rather than its ability to educate, agitate, comfort and inspire. So in this time of lockdown, we're all turning to art more than ever uh, before as, as an antidote to social isolation and hence why we believe it's an important area to frame our socialist response and analysis to coronavirus. As it was May Day last week, we're really excited to be emphasizing the importance of sector-wide trade union support. Different fields of the art sector are often isolated from each other and it's vital that these workplaces enact solidarity, not just between artists, but all cultural workers, as well as find creative forms of resistance and integrate actions into wider struggles. We've seen this in countless examples of designers repurposing their sewing machines to make PPE for frontline workers, resistance banners uh, appearing outside homes all across the world, and collective singing from balconies to ease the effects of isolation. We recognise that there are so many different approaches and perspectives on this issue and are really happy to have 
such a quality range of speakers providing insight from specific labor struggles in the sector, international perspectives on protecting art scenes and how we can broaden these acts of solidarity to wider struggles during and post COVID-19. Just before we start, we wanted to share a few links with you of platforms to access art and new creative content and campaigns. We'll also be sharing a report of this call uh, with all the links included in the next day or so. So those links should be in the chat right about now. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, thanks Dan Lewis, by the way, for doing all the tech. Tech in, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, just before we start, we're gonna give a really quick outline of the amazing speakers we have on the call tonight. Um, we got a little bit excited about today's call and our, our schedule is absolutely packed with a wide range of uh, experiences from the art sector um, and analysis on how we deepen and spread acts of solidarity within and beyond the cultural sector. So we're going to be opening with remarks from Dr. Stephen Pritchard, who's an artist, activist and academic and one of the founders of the Movement for Cultural Democracy, which started at the World Transformed in 2017. Who, uh, and Stephen's gonna be framing the conversation around how and why we desperately need to democratize the arts industry and how its funding structures exacerbate inequalities across the sector. And then we'll be hearing from Clara Payard, uh, president of PCS Union Culture Group and branch secretary at National Museums Liverpool, who'll be providing an insight into her experience of struggles within the museum industry. Next, uh, we have Hansika Jethnani, who is a poet, visual artist and queer body positive femme based in Mumbai. Uh, and she's gonna be sharing her experiences of how coronavirus has impacted both her work and creative communities in Mumbai. And then we'll be hearing from Paul Fleming, who's a candidate to be Equity's next general secretary and is a labor counselor for Faraday Ward in Southwark. Uh, and he'll be sharing an insight into struggles specific to the theater industry and how coronavirus is threatening the sector. Next up, we have Chris, Anna and Anahi from uh, UVW's newly formed Designers and Cultural Workers Branch, which is a cross-sector trade union organizing isolated groups of workers across the creative industries. We're gonna be hearing more about how the branch is winning demands and also about their brilliant studio rent freeze campaign. And finally, um, we'll be hearing from Dana Roo, who is a DJ, producer, and also runs KMA60 Record Store in Berlin. Uh, and she'll give us an insight into her experience of how coronavirus is affecting the music industry in Berlin and how the German government's financial aid to art institutions is helping art workers during the crisis. Uh, so we should be done with the call in around 90 minutes. Uh, and just to say, that if you have any questions during the call, please post them in the chat box and uh, we and the rest of the speakers will try and do our best to cover them. Where, where this isn't possible, um, we'll try our best to fold these up into um, follow up discussions. Um, and finally, we're, we're still figuring things out with Zoom, as you might have seen with our sort of mix up <laughs> with uh, mute. Um, so, yeah, please just be patient with us um, and uh, yeah, just bear with us if we've got any technical glitches. <laughs> right. So that's loads of speakers this evening. <laughs> so without further ado, um, we'll move to our first community artist, independent academic activist, writer and one of the original members of the Movement for Cultural Democracy, Stephen Pritchard. Hey, Hello, Stephen. Hi. Hi. Hey, there you right. are. And so to kick us off right away, could you tell us a little bit about how the function of arts and culture changes when lockdown is imposed and how the Arts Council has responded? Um, I, th I think that the, uh, the function of arts and culture on the one hand has obviously, as you've described, changed immensely in terms of it's like pretty much stopped in terms of the, the sort of what people would class as, as, uh, as I guess, accepted forms of arts and culture by the state, defined forms. But on the other hand, I think that um, it's interesting to see just how much uh, how much people have have moved, have have come to rely on creativity within communities, within the home. And for me, it's that's interesting because as a community artist, I'm really interested. For me, I always think of uh, home being where we start from, not galleries, not theatres, not, mu not music centers and all the rest of it. Um, and so it's interesting to see the responses, the stuff like everybody's got things in the windows, um, people choking on the paths and, and isn't it, you know, and, and, and coming up with all sorts of creative responses um, to that. And I, so for me, I think that the function um, has changed uh, quite, quite interestingly. And that's been noted uh, uh, recently by even the Chief Executive of Arts Council England, Darren Henley. Darren Henley 
um, pointing out that the sort of there, the, the Arts Council recognise there is no going back, and that that the, the the relationship between art, culture, and communities is something that's crucial, not just during the lockdown, but as we as we come out of the lockdown. Um, so yeah, I think that the functions definitely change in terms of uh, how the Arts Council have responded. I would say that the Arts Council, um, and I'm being a a fairly uh, vocal critic of the Arts Council quite often, but you know that's part of the the culture uh, culture policy cultural policy game. Do you know what I mean? The, the criticism needs to be there, but I think on this occasion the Arts Council Arts Council England have have done very very well indeed um, in terms of dealing with this as best they can for the arts and cultural sector. They've given out grants that's nowhere near enough. It has caused competition between artists. Many artists haven't been successful. Um, um, same with organisations and MPOs. It's nowhere near enough money. And I think that it's going to be um, catastrophic for many people, many artists, many small arts organisations, community arts organisations. And I think the, the, the real worry and the real interesting thing will be how many of the big arts organisations can survive because they're actually in the most vulnerable position. Most of them relied on, on shops and cafes and, and merchandise, and, and that's pretty much stopped, right? The National Theatre can stream stuff online, but it ain't going to save them. This huge, the 90 million pounds is nowhere near enough money to deal with the big arts organisations. And so I think it's interesting to see with the, the Arts Council's new 10-year um, strategy, let's create, and it's interesting to see Darren Henley referencing that, because for me, that is a... a, a, a offers a, 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 what is for Arts Council England a radical shift in direction towards communities and towards um, other forms of culture which have perhaps not been recognised at all or haven't really been supported recently as well as they could have done or have been in the past. So I think that, I think that for me, I think that Arts Council are doing is a, a very good job and I would like to see us all push them to, to, to really focus on the struggling artists, arts workers, and also investing much more in communities. And I guess that's where Movement for Cultural Democracy comes in. Amazing, Stephen. Um, thanks so much. Also, amazing artwork behind you, just to <laughs> sort of spot. <laughs> <The tickets>. um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Alice and Sebastian's. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if, um, considering in this moment, um, Obviously, so many people are kind of um, picking up musical instruments or um, engaging in a kind of um, ordinary version of culture where mm -hmm. everyone is an artist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, whether you think there's like an opportunity here to, to build on on um, to build on this right now, um, rather than sort of, you know, leaving it to the Arts Council. Um, I think people are building on it. I think people are organising and self-organising all over the place. Um, right now, and I mean that everyone from families and people on WhatsApp, at schools, uh, community groups, I'm doing stuff which links um, community garden sharing with art projects as well, and for me that's a form of art, the act of gardening, the, the, it's a performance and there's a whole load of performativity there, and I think there's all sorts of people getting involved that haven't before um, and are, are coming together, so I do see that, that people are doing it anyway, and I certainly don't think we should um, uh, rely on the Arts Council. I'm certainly not, although I'm grateful for the support that they give me. But um, it's certainly there. There's definitely, as I say, an opportunity to, on a policy level, should like encourage the, the the government and the Arts Council to see the need for things like cultural democracy to understand the importance of that. Ordinary culture is just as important, in fact, more important. Right? Let's face it. 80 or 90 percent of people don't go to any arts events that's classed basically that's classed as arts and culture that's mainly funded right and, and a few spectacles here and there for the masses is not good enough right and 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 what what annoys me and what 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 you know my roots as a community artist takes me back to thinking about what what, what have we lost it through austerity and before that through tony blair what have we lost we've lost all the community centers we've lost the youth clubs we've lost the art clubs the amdram clubs, choirs, brass bands, all the jazz bands, right, the, the, the marching bands, everything, all these things, loads and loads more besides. And, and the, 
you know, I think that it's about what we're seeing now is a realization with people saying, OK, we can do stuff together. We can share things online. We can go and do community gardening. We can get involved and organize ourselves. And I think it's 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 incredibly important that the, the policymakers, the government, the state, the, the Labour Party, and I think Tracy Brabham did a, an interesting document quite recently around cultural policy, and I hope that's followed up by Labour, because to be honest with you, Labour themselves haven't got a very good record with um, with um, how it invests in communities and in ordinary culture. In fact, if anything, it's the Labour Party, it, it's the it's the it's new Labour that is responsible for all these massive glass citadels to arts that that the very privileged few go to. You know, and art's not magical, and it's nowhere near enough for for, for a few people to experience brilliant um, art and culture when everybody else is left with absolutely nothing, and that includes many artists as well with very little pay, precarious work. And, and for most people, the, the, the feeling that, that society doesn't value their creativity. And you know what, for me, the creativity exists in, that exists within working class communities is the most amazing of all. And the stories that are told and the music and the way that people create is far better than any opera that I've ever seen. Definitely amazing. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we've, uh, we've got one, one last quick question, uh, just from Alex Brent, who um, says, will COVID-19 prevent ACE, uh, that's Arts Council England, from carrying out the strategy that you meant mentioned before? Um, and how can we pressure them to retain this direction? Um, I would say, um, no, it won't. Um, it will encourage them. I think Arts Council England made a very brave move in Let's Create. They basically, if you read it, it, it it's offended mainly, it's offended lots of people. And I think a lot of that's unjustified, some of it's justified. But the ones who it's offended most are the big organizations because it's basically pushing them much more towards communities and it's talking about relevance to, to people, to everybody, not just people who go to see the arts. And for many of the big organizations, they are irrelevant to most people and they have not, they say nothing about most people's lives. So I think that it won't prevent them. I think Arts Council were hoping and, and, and I'm, I'm aware of some things that were going to happen that they were very worried about let's create and that underneath this the delivery stage which has should have been released but has been held back would have been even more offensive to big arts organizations because it's about it was arts council signaling signaling a shift in in direction and i think this is in a way going to push them much more towards um towards supporting everyday culture and and and, and therefore fulfilling hopefully for me the radical potential that exists within Let's Create. And I think it's up to all of us to make sure that we push for that too. And we recognize that there are many people, um, many people who need support. And I think that it's, a, it's, it's very much about showing the importance of all sorts of culture, working class culture and everybody's cultures, rather than just this narrow definition. I think Arts Council are aware, are aware of it. And I think we must push for that um, and, and I think that's something that I'm trying to develop through through this lockdown period. That's amazing, Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, I urge urge everyone to um, look at the work that Stephen and the gang have been doing with uh, Movement for Cultural Democracy. It's, it's really quality um, and really interesting as well. There was there was I just wanted to share really quickly or maybe I'll maybe I'll just get ask you to share really quickly uh, an example of when um, you were asking a community about participatory budgeting. Yeah. Um, and in, and it was re with regards to like cultural funding and instead of, well, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh, uh, so, so on one occasion, I sometimes like to, to tease people and, and I, I, I explained the movement for cultural democracy basically believes in a radical redistribution of arts funding and support and, and, and definition of what culture, all our cultures are. And so at an event I talked in um, and said, imagine if communities were given uh, the, their, um, the amount of money, lottery money that was spent on them, not just for the arts, but for arts, community, heritage and um, sport as a, a lump sum and a, a group of grassroots community members were, in it, were allowed to decide on how that money was spent and, decide, and, 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 and deliver culture in their local areas. And a person at the back said, said well, they'll just spend it all on, on culture, on, sorry, on football. And um, I said, what's wrong with that? And they said, well, they wouldn't support, they definitely wouldn't support what I do. And I said, well, what does that say about what you do? 
what does that say about your relevance to your communities? And and anyway, what's wrong with spending it on football? They're not going to spend it on football year after year after year. And to be honest with you, working class people, right? Young young people, girls, boys, everybody need more football pitches. So what's wrong with that? And in, in and in there's many ways that that's a, an inherent part of many people's cultures in this country. But um, yeah, so we believe in in, in a very broad understanding of culture, um, and 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 part of that is because. The arts and um, what's become seen as arts and culture is far too narrowly defined and elitist, and we want to break that. That's quality, Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, I think that gives like a brilliant framing for our conversation this evening. Um, and also, yeah, so great to kind of have a wider understanding of, of what culture is, as well as talking very specifically about um, struggles for workers within the arts and cultural um, sector. Um, speaking of which, we're now going to be hearing from a uh, self-professed French scouser, <laughs> uh, the president of PCS Union Culture Group and branch secretary at National Museums Liverpool, who's led numerous campaigns in the museum sector, including the strikes at the National Gallery against privatisation in 2015, Clara Payard. Hey, Clara, can you hear me? Hello, yeah, are you okay? Yeah, really good. So, yeah, just wanted to, like, kick things off, at saying, like, so museums were like the first premises to close before schools, pubs and restaurants, before any government measures were announced to protect workers. So how did did PCS react in the sector to protect cultural workers? OK, well, first of all, I just want to give love and solidarity to everybody on this call, you know, in very strange and difficult times and everybody is affected differently. So I think it's really important to link up. So thanks for, you know, the organizer of this meeting. And it's good to hear from Stephen and the work they, uh, they've done uh, that we've been also involved in. And um, just to say, I'm giving a different perspective from like the union side. So the PCS culture group represents about 4,000 museum workers across England, Scotland and Wales. And the PCS union is more like a civil servant of government or contract of government uh, union. And we've been like leading many battles against privatization of National Gallery in 2015 with 111 days of strike, National Museums of Wales and Scotland against, uh, you know, cuts in weekend pay at the Tate around zero hours contract. We've had numerous battles about the living wage. And as you said, we museums were the first to close. Um, actually, we closed on, most museums closed on the 17th, uh, and then the lockdown was not till the 23rd. So as a union, we had to react very quickly. Um, my branch in the Liverpool Museum, we actually spoke about COVID at our AGM on the 27th of February, and we put a number of demands on our employers, and so did other branches at you know, the Tate, and the British Museum, the National Gallery. We are very concerned about the COVID uh, situation. We were asking for guarantees around 100% pay, sick pay, no detriment to our members, which ultimately we've managed to secure for people who are employed directly by the National Museums uh, who come under the umbrella of the Department for uh, Culture, Media and Sports. And, but quickly we realized that it was much wider that people were directly employed. So in a number of museums, we've got private company working. Uh, I'll give the example of the National Gallery where we've had privatization to a company called Securitas. Uh, we are in a situation right now where uh, Securitas uh, wasn't providing any pay uh, for people with underlying condition who had to self-isolate earlier than everybody else. Uh, they've now furloughed those people, but they suffer the detriment. We've got other example again at the National Gallery, which is one of the main culprits, where the company operating the audio guide antenna uh, dismiss any staff working for them for less than two years, or the Sodexos that uh, employ the cleaners uh, ultimately are trying to move people to other sites uh, without paying them. So it's uh, it's not ideal, but overall we've managed to secure uh, quite good sort of guarantees for people who directly work. But we thought about this solidarity. We, this is not just about the PCS members who work in museums. Actually, we had very much concern for non-unionized workplaces. Uh, lots of museums haven't got any unions. There may be small workplaces. We've got a lot of self-employed people, whether they are artists or they carry out 
audio or video roles. We've got people on zero hours contract. Uh, we've got a disproportionate effect of uh, you know, this, this COVID situation on black and Asian workers, women, disabled workers, older workers. Uh, so solidarity is a key and uh, we've been working with other unions and uh, grassroots uh, organization. We've got uh, Art Workers Forum, mainly in London, trying to organize and put pressure on employers. Um, we've also, as a union, we've put demands of, on our employers to ensure that anybody who is self-employed and at contract with us is actually paid and those contracts are honored, that artists that have been commissioned for pieces still get uh, paid for that, that zero hours contract uh, workers get an average pay uh, secured. We also secured guarantee for agency workers at the British Museum, for example. Um, we need a united response and that's the key. I mean, I'm really pleased and looking forward to hear from our uh, comrade in the UVW art worker branch. Uh, but we've also got people in back to the artist union England, equity, prospect, the musician unions that we are linking with. At the end of that, we're dealing with an impact of 10 years of austerity. We know that about the NHS, the care sector, but also in museum and galleries. The sector have got a lot of precarious workers. Um, we haven't got a system to fund uh, artist production, contrary to my own country in France. Uh, we've got many workers who are uh, working for agency on zero hours contract, as I said. Ultimately, the art sector is dominated by uh, people who have got power in society. And when you look at the board of trustees of our national museums, you know, it's you know the Getty of this world, the Rothschild, and you know you've got uh, former uh, director of the CBI, of the former governor, governor of the Bank of England. You've got all sponsorships. So we need to reclaim our art and culture sector. And uh, I'm not sure how long I've got, and I don't think I can hear anything or know if anybody can hear me, but uh, I'll conclude on uh, there is big challenges right now. I mean, we've just sort of dealing with a furlough situation uh, and we've had battles with uh, the minister uh, ministry to fund those furlough properly. But next is coming the reopenings. Uh, museums soon, but other venues uh, will start talking about reopening and what measures are put in place for the health and safety of not only visitors or people who use the venues, but the workers. We will support no return to work in unsafe condition. We are very clear on that. At the meantime, we need to talk about a rescue package for the sector. Uh, the funding drive of the arts and culture sector in the last 10 years has been cuts, austerity, privatization and outsourcing. We need to bring back the services in house. We need to make sure that the art sector is properly funded. There are minimum standards across the sector and that's what PCS Culture Group you know, will be working to. We are planning a, an event on the 18th of May that hopefully many of you will join. We need to develop international solid solidarity links. So we are seeking to link up with our comrades in uh, French museums and Italian museums union to hear from their uh, experience and make sure that you know we benefit from. You know. On the bright side, and I think Stephen have, has uh, spoken about that. There is a lot of creative going on during the lockdown online or, and solidarity. So. We are organizing online, we need to carry on. So again, this event is great. I've spoken about the Art Workers Forum. Uh, we've got you know, young women reps in the South Bank Center working with Museum Detox to produce uh, lockdown magazines. You see all those live performances, choirs, DJing, concert, art lessons. It's inspiring. But the reality is that uh, it's gonna be a struggle and we need to take that on because we never want nothing without any struggle. So, you know, my message is don't go breaking our hearts and uh, let's carry on to organizing up and solidarity. Thanks. Thank you, Clara, that was brilliant. Um, and a great scope of all the different people that are hit um, 
the precarious workers that aren't necessarily union members, like you say. And just while you were speaking, we had a shout out from Julie Ward, who was on the picket line with you at the National Gallery and says hello. Hi, um, <laughs> and also Fiona Rowe um, in the chat whilst you were speaking asked what she can do as a member of a gallery to uh, best show solidarity with the union. Well, I mean, if you work in a, in a gallery, or not just in a gallery, you know, if you work in a theatre, if you work in a cinema, if you are a self-employed artist, I think look into joining a union because uh, if we organise collectively, that's going to be the key into responding. And when you see what's going on with this government, they've been forced to basically, you know, implement sort of massive state intervention policy. Let's not forget, it's not just COVID going on. You know, we've got climate change, we've got massive inequalities. So we've got huge challenges. I think hopefully from this crisis, we can also have, you know, positive outcome. And I think we all need to hope and rely on that to carry on the struggle. So what I would say is our ancestors from anywhere they've like gone through terrible times through history and we are like living through history periods that's going really fast. So let's hang on there, link up solidarity and we will find collective solution. Brilliant. Thanks, Clara. Solidarity um, with you as well. That was brilliant. And we're really grateful for you taking the time to speak to us tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to say that it'd be really good to hear some of your suggestions for useful things that people can get involved with. So post those suggestions in the chat and we'll try and share them with everyone as the call's going on um, and at the end. So we're really grateful. We've got around 200 people on the call. Um, and before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to take this opportunity to plug the TWT Supporters Network. So. Uh, we know many people are in tough financial situations, especially right now, um, and we will always ensure that content like this call is available free of charge to everyone. However, if you do think that calls like this are important in this time of global crisis um, and uncertainty uh, and are secure financially, please consider supporting TWT. The coronavirus um, poses an existential threat to independent grassroots organisations like us, so if you're able to donate 50% <laughs> not 50 five pound well or 50 that'd be yeah. great uh, five pound a month it'd be it'd make a huge difference in enabling us to scale up and sustain our political education work uh, you can sign up at theworldtransformed.org slash support which is being posted at, at multiple times <laughs> on the chat um the link is uh, also in the chat um yeah so thanks so much that's theworldtransformed.org slash support so very quickly, um, on to our next speaker now, um, which is um, Hansika Jethnani, who is a poet, visual artist and queer body positive femme based in Mumbai. Um, her work explores a variety of themes, including sexuality, trauma, healing, mental health, body positivity and migration. She's interested in decolonization and the dismantling of oppressive structures institutionalized within wider society. Um, Hopefully she's on the call, but actually we're going to play a couple of videos um, for, oh, hi. Um, we're going to play um, a couple of videos first, um, just so that you can give like a little bit of an overview um, and then play the uh, Decolonizing Bombay video straight after, and then we'll have um, a couple of questions. Thanks very much. India's culture is so historically rich and full of art. Whether it's their paintings from the Mughal Empire or erotic sculptures in temples dating back to 950 AD. But art as a subject, concept, and even means to make ends meet is taken seriously by only few in the country, often also dominated by the more privileged, rich sections of society. You will find street artists selling their miniature paintings in front of fancy art galleries in South Bombay a stark disparity then and there. The street artists are left with nowhere to sell in such a time, whereas the fancy art galleries have links with Christie's and Sotheby's and will always be able to find a way to support their artists by selling their work online to really rich art collectors. There are also so, so many craftspeople that work in the fashion, textile, handicrafts industry, artisans of their own kind producing all kinds of work from jewelry to ornaments. But these are often jobs found to earn quick money. 
these workers are known as daily wage earners. And they're actually the behind the scene backbone workers of big institutions and brands. And help to them at a time like this is coming from NGOs, not the government. A Ministry of Culture exists in India, but does extremely minimal work to preserve and also amplify arts and culture in a more meaningful and tangible way, other than ensuring the running of long-term monuments and supporting important events, and then showing up to tweet about them. They offer barely any scholarships or funding opportunities for the arts. There is no arts council or equivalent here. Oftentimes it is private organizations, some of which set themselves up as not-for-profits that push and allow the functioning of the arts and culture sector here, which then also tends to become a bit elitist. A crisis like COVID-19 has meant that the arts and culture sector here is facing an unprecedented challenge, given its already fragile and vulnerable ecosystems. There is no information about what resources will be put in place and the organizations that do exist are scrambling to make ends meet and help others. There is just so little support and infrastructure for the arts here, which I think stems from a larger culture issue where STEM as a subject and an industry has always been propelled forward and encouraged in comparison. I've been seeing in the last few weeks, a lot of different things online. The Great Bombay Circus, an institution marking its 100th birthday this year is crowdfunding to make up for the loss of shows in the next few months in order to support its staff and its circus artists to pay their bills and put food on the table for themselves and their families. Smaller organizations that work closely with art galleries have begun selling art online especially through Instagram at reasonable prices to help support freelance artists. I've seen the closure of an arts organization, Janoon, already struggling to keep themselves afloat pre-corona. And as soon as the crisis hit, they had no choice but to call it a day on the entire organization. So while there is a little bit of community-based solutions happening to immediately support the impact of the virus, in the long term, there is still no concrete assurance as to how things will be for the arts and cultural sector here. I think in order for the arts and cultural sector in India to truly thrive, there are a number of practices that need to be made mainstream by the government, various institutes, and the whole of society, really. The first most crucial thing being seeing the value of art in society seeing art as an inherent social good, as a tool and means to build knowledge and break barriers, to have conversations, to understand the impact art can have in times of social crisis, the positive impact it can have on one's well-being. And normalizing these sentiments from a young age for everyone, bringing art to everyone, regardless of their background, and secondly, strategizing means of actually funding the organizations trying to keep the arts afloat in India. Without these two things, regardless of COVID-19 or not, the arts could be doomed here. So while COVID-19 has obviously massively impacted the art sector here, I think that a lot of underlying issues were always there. And a huge part of moving forward from this for people here will be acknowledging those underlying issues. Bombay, a piece of the colonial cake eaten by the British Empire. Oh, Dan, we're not seeing the video on there. If um, it's really Are you able to check that, Dan, and restart? Sorry, one sec. Like we said, some um, technical glitches. Sorry. Um, should be sorted in a sec. Okay, brilliant. Can we start from the beginning, please, Dan? Thank you. Cheers. Bombay, a piece of the colonial cake eaten by the British Empire. Unscathed, yet extremely shattered. 
where life moves by at a pace so different to Britain. Yet the remnants of British rule are too precisely intact. There is buildings that existed from the time of empire, no matter where you go. There is buildings that we're told exist because of you. We're a colonial leftover still craving for colonial cake. Our ads are painted with fair-skinned people. Mainstream models and actresses are predominantly fair-skinned people. We're a society deeply entrenched in colorism. We're deeply divided because of colonialism. Divide and rule ruined our people. Being South Asian became about Hindu versus Muslim. Our brothers and sisters became our enemies because you divided us to be. Partition left more people homeless than any other tragedy in this world. But I bet you didn't know that because your history curriculum in school doesn't teach you that. Bombay, you are carved in elegance and chaos, swimming in colonial structures and colonial language. Did you know I call you Bombay instead of Mumbai, even though Bombay is the name colonialism gave me? Colonialism, the language on my tongue. The reason I can't recite this poem to you in Urdu or Hindi. Hansika, thanks so much for that. And um, and thanks for giving us film. We've, we've never played like um, a speaker and a speaker's film like that before. Um, so uh, yeah, trying to push the boat out a little bit <laughs> in that. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, did you have anything to, to add as well before I, uh, you know, ask some follow up questions off the back of it? See if we can get you unmuted as well. Oh, still muted. Does that work? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh thank you so much. That's okay. I just wanted to say that maybe my um, little like spiel about what's happening here sounded a little negative. Um, but yeah, I do feel that like, in a very, very large part, the arts is not taken seriously here. Like, for example, um, there is no data uh, collected about the arts and potentially how much the arts se sector contributes to the G GDP of the economy. Um, so it's kind of things like this that have always been the case. So a huge crisis like this has obviously just made it 10 times worse. Um, you know, and yeah, like it is kind of a situation that is full of doom and gloom. And yeah, there are people trying to help. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, until it's taken uh, more seriously uh, at a state level and at an institutional level, um, things are always gonna be a little like gloomy and like unstructured. And yeah, that's kind of just, yeah. It. I loved um, you mentioning um, about um... Uh, people selling things um, as kind of independent, um, like arts workers, um, mm -hmm. and how that seemed to link a lot with what Stephen was mentioning at the at the start of the call about how um, and and like what you were saying about Sotheby's and you know for some of the sort of um, higher profile artists they will they will be fine with this and they're the ones where the funding will go straight away. But the mm -hmm. economy of much smaller scale um, arts workers um, becomes incredibly precarious, even if it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was precarious before, but it becomes even more precarious under these sort of um, circumstances. So I suppose, um, and we've had some great comments in the chat just saying about how great it is to get an internationalist mm -hmm. perspective on it. But I think what really um, resonated with me was how much, how similar it sounds mm -hmm. um, to to the precariousness of arts work, particularly for, for um, yeah, like independent arts workers um, similarly. Um, yeah. I think even like the concept of being a freelancer, um, for instance, it's it's really difficult in the UK and it's equally, if not like more difficult here because um, there's, yeah, there's just no no support for people that work as freelance artists. Um, and so the, the, the painters that might be kind of 
selling their paintings outside um, art galleries in in South Bombay, they're they're equally as precarious. Like there's no there's no institution that they can go to for support really when they're just like, you know, making their work and trying to sell it for a living. Hmm. Um, we've had a question. Um, from Ekua Bayunu in the chat here. And she's just said, um, Hansika, are you aware of artists working together to work with each other or communities to address their issues? And is there any kind of collectivizing like artist solidarity within, within the situation? Um, yeah, there are a few pages on Instagram um, that like have started trying to help artists uh, get their work out uh, at this time and like basically selling artwork of artists. but. Other than that, uh, I haven't really seen any kind of uh, thing in the arts sector here where, you know, a community has come together to to really like help each other. Um, yeah, I, I feel like um, in Bombay and like generally in India, like things are quite um, all over the place, and it's it's like organizing is uh, is something that works really differently as well. And I think when it comes to the arts, even more so, like people quite uh, people work quite isolatedly, uh, even in the little organizations that they have. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's needed very much so. Um, but yeah, like it's just not a reality at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a um, uh, more of a comment than a question, um, but we've had a comment from Tanya Singh in response to a question um, in the chat saying that um, there are someone asking whether there are kind of um, elite um, art schools in um, uh, in Mumbai as well. Um, yeah, I thought that was fascinating what you were saying about like um, colonial language kind of seeping its way into everything as well. Um, but yeah, Tanya Singh um, said there are prestigious yeah, yeah. art schools in, in uh, Bombay or Mumbai, um, but the student body is predominantly upper class and, and upper caste, um, yeah. which kind of reflects like a lot of what we see um, here as well in terms of yeah. you know the kind of the dominance of bougie people in in these kind of arts institutions and educational institutions as well. Yeah, um, very much so and I think there's also uh, alongside that the reason why um, I think that's just so difficult to like move past or change for for so so many years is is this this idea that the arts is is not going to be able to allow you to sustain yourself so if you and when people are already from a lower socioeconomic background obviously money is a huge huge concern and and if if they if they are not being uh, encouraged or made to feel like they're going to be able to be a successful artist for the lack of a better word then then there's already that um and yeah i think the art, the art industry kind of everywhere is anyway already quite elitist and in a place like India where it's still very much um, entrenched in classism and casteism, it's even more the case. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for that, Hansika. Um, and thanks so much for sharing your film. That was really brilliant um, to get the, in, like Sam said, the internationalist response with such a creative um, uh, response to that that was brilliant i know you've got another call straight away so so we'll let you go um and thanks for joining us um right so our next speaker is a candidate to be equity's next general secretary uh, and is a labor councillor for faraday ward in southwark paul fleming can you hear us paul oh yeah brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So, Paul, um, can you tell us about the unique position of performers and stage management and equity members generally and what the union's been doing to protect their interests? Over to you. Yeah, so I, it's th um, thank you and, and, and thank you too to the, the other speakers, which have been fascinating. That, that kind of cross sector solidarity, I think at this moment is vital, and indeed cross industry, cross worker solidarity, wherever people um, are working. Um, I suppose there's been, for, for, for us, there are three big challenges. I mean, challenge one has been um, the closure and the immediate panic. The second is, is the, the, the kind of mothballing period, this period of inactivity. And then the third, which I think is the biggest, most frightening, but also the most hopeful challenge, is the challenge of reopening um, theatres, reopening um, the, the theatre industry. And I, I suppose that's, that's probably what I'll speak about most, but an awful lot of the the challenges are reflected in um, for, for, for people working in the recorded sectors as well, that is film um, and TV. 
Um, as a union, we, it's, it's been a remarkable um, uh, sort of turning around of the Titanic to, to get the industry closed in a way that respects um, the interests of, 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 of our members as, as, as best as possible. Um, and, and just to give a kind of flavour of that, in, in theatre we have this, we, we, we have clauses on our collective agreements, most um, artists at any one time are working on one of our collective agreements and where they're not, then our collective agreements tend to set an industry standard by which others are followed. So independent artists very often work on the basis of our independent theatre council agreements, even if they're not expressly on it. Um, and in the subsidised sector, what we had was a series of clauses that because of the Arts Council's response, as we mentioned earlier, were able to respond to this crisis in a pretty reasonable way, paying out union minimum in most instances, supporting people, giving sort of notice payments, if you like, where otherwise they may not have done, um, and kind of allowing the industry to slowly judder to a halt. In the commercial sector, much, much more serious. So, um, you know, I, I look after the West End of London, which has our biggest and oldest uh, collective agreement. Um, it, it, well, not biggest, but oldest collective uh, agreement that we hold. And actually, we, we were faced with this crisis on the 16th of March, where we were worried that every single, well, worried, I mean, that the reality was that every single theatre production, um, both in, on regional tours and in the West End of London, was about to close um, with immediate effect. We've managed in that, in that circumstance actually to wrestle something better than our collective agreement would provide for the first four weeks, um, which was to keep people on contract um, and to provide them union minimum for a period, or we tried to negotiate with government and find out how we could best protect um, our members, no matter where they're working. And, and indeed our members are not only working in theatre, and TV and film, but a variety of artists as well, independent uh, working people, whether that be comedians, burlesque artists, children's entertainers, clowns, um, circus artists, and so on. We ended up with the government scheme, the government self-employed scheme, which you know, is not really receiving the attention in the media that it should do. You know, the failure to extend it, the, the, the way in which it doesn't cover so many people. So if your earnings fall below a certain threshold, if you don't have complete tax records for a period, uh, for, for a three year period, you're massively disadvantaged. For some workers in the arts who might appear wealthier than they actually are. So you get one very good year, one very good advert, one very good run of royalties or secondary payments. And actually they suddenly appear wealthier than, than, than they are, are completely discredited. If your net profit over a three year average is more than 50,000 excluded entirely. New graduates, people who are returning to the industry because of caring responsibilities, all excluded. Nevertheless, it's a scheme that kind of works for a good a, a good set of people um, and we've kind of managed to to slowly if you like wind the sector down for a period that we anticipate of prolonged pause because of social distancing and, and mass gathering guidelines um, and indeed you know, on the west end of london what we've managed to do is is, is achieve um, lump sum payments for the vast majority of shows we were worried we were going to see most shows closed actually it, it see it appears that we've saved just over um, 40 odd of the 53 shows that were open or due to open um, over those six months periods, not without a massive fight. There was one period where we were genuinely worried that we might lose the oldest collective agreement that the union had. And um, this crisis has genuinely put into doubt not only the very existence of individual shows or the union itself, but also the industry and every pillar within it. I mean, it has been that catastrophic. Um, and a lot of members have suffered, suffered incredible anxiety as well as financial hardship um, throughout that. But I think now as we turn through the government's very, very inadequate response, it has to be said for arts workers and for the arts and entertainment sectors, we look towards reopening. And, and there's an awful lot of anxiety about reopening, um, in particular, um, what does social distancing and mass, guide, uh, uh, and mass gathering guidelines do to the reopening of the industry? How do you open a theatre? when you can't have an audience? How do our members interact with dressers, indeed each other? How do they rehearse? Um, how do they interact in and out of stage doors? How do they go onto a film set? How do they work on TV? How, how, how do they do that in a way that's safe for them and the people they interact with when they go home or um, are on the way um, to go home? You know, those are, are, are causes of massive, massive anxiety. And in, in a situation where the government self-employed scheme might end, before the industry can reasonably economically reopen. What we are very anxious about is that workers are not bounced into reopening um, the industry because they have to, because the government has failed to provide the economic support for people. 
um, because you can mothball buildings, but you can't mothball people. You can't mothball a workforce, both an active and inactive workforce. And that is our really, really big concern. But, but when you look across the industry, what you see is the shallowness of um, a decade or more of government policy. So, you know, if, if, in the British subsidised uh, uh, theatre sector, um, theatres over the past 10, 15 years have been shoved into a commercialised model. Open a bar, open a restaurant, sell more tickets, have a commercial tour put out there. And that's the only way you can feasibly operate. But if you can't open that crush bar in the theatre because the footage is too small, if you can't open the restaurant attached to it, if you can't put out the commercial tour because multiple venues are um, failing to, to, to add up um, uh, schedules in, in, in such a chaotic time, how do you survive? You know, a major a funded national institution phoned me on the 16th of, uh, sorry, on the 17th of March, which was the day after the theatres closed, to say we have enough money to, to stay mothballed for 10 weeks. And, and that is a shocking position for one of the best funded, biggest theatres um, in the country. I mean, and, and, and it's not getting any better because the hollowness, the shallowness of the government's model for institutions, for organisations, for producers has been revealed but also for artists as well, but obviously more importantly for the artists as well, because what we don't have in this country is any sort of um, art, you know, artist-based state provision. You might look at some sort of universal basic income or some sort of benefit system as we did have in this country for some time, or indeed um, you know, a, a model more akin to what happens in, in France. You know, there's a re, or, or, although that of course under threat um, very recently. So, what, what, what we're doing now is to survive the mothballing period, particularly for people who are parents, particularly for people who are working class, particularly for people who are DDEF disabled artists who aren't able um, to access support in a way that other people might. We are terrified that there is going to be an exodus of talent from the industry from, under, from already underrepresented groups. The government has to step in to support those people, first and foremost as well as then looking forward to a new model of how we fund theatre to get it back open. Because look, if the government stays with the model that it has, which is a quasi commercialized subsidized position, the commercial sector won't be able to survive because it won't have the product or the talent going into it. And the subsidized sector won't survive because it won't have the money going into it because it needs to have full houses, it needs to have full bars, full restaurants, full commercial tours um, under the government's current model. Now, now, now that sounds quite terrifying, but I personally think that, you know, if we're strong and we stay together and union membership has increased, now our membership on the West End has gone from 75%, which was good, to over 80%, which is fantastic. By sticking together um, as working people across sectors, across industries, we can make demands as to how we reopen the industry in a really, really enthusiastic way. Uh, and, and in a way that's potentially revolutionary for the way um, art is presented and, and the protections that the workforce have. So let's think about, so A, there's the funding for institutions, which is important, but you know, you know that's, that, that's the producer's problem. Let's, if, 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 I, I don't want to see workplaces reopening unless it's safe for the most vulnerable member. We should not be presuming that theatres are okay to open just because um, the average relatively healthy actor of a particular age is able to go back. What about people who are carers? What about people who are, um, you know, who, who have um, respiratory uh, uh, um, problems? What about older um, actors, in particular, um, older actresses um, who are already underrepresented in the jobs market and actually are going to be further discriminated against um, if there are social distancing guidelines uh, to, to, to reopen theatres for older people? No reopening until it's safe for the most vulnerable of working people in a reasonable way. And that actually is a really good thing to, to start, start saying, well, let's change who we're talking about when we're talking about the, um, the workforce um, in, in theatre, uh, TV, film, uh, in, in, in the arts. Um, what about, and, and you know, that there is going to be a period of serious um, economic downturn. I think it's almost inevitable that that comes out. How do we resist that? And what do we seek to see come out of it? The union was about to go into negotiations for a five day rehearsal week. Um, in the West End of London and in um, the big subsidised um, houses in um, the regions and nations. Well, um, I don't think this is a bad time to start those negotiations. I think it is an excellent time to start those negotiations, to talk about the work-life balance, to talk about 
um, the ability of our men. You know, most trade unions got a five day working week about 1911. Why is this sector so far behind? And in a time where industry pay is going to be hard to push up, it's working hours and those other conditions that we really, really can and will focus on. Issues like dignity at work, issues like code of conduct for auditions, you know, written collective agreements, protecting people in the strongest possible way. You know, this really is a chance with, with more people standing together, more people in the union, a bolder vision for theatre, and actually our ability to stand together and look after the most uh, people who've been historically made the most vulnerable by um, producers in the industry. Actually reopening, I think, is a really, really exciting moment but it is gonna require the government to change tack, to protect people in the interim, and to ch fundamentally change the way in which, it, in, in which its funding model works, because otherwise there isn't gonna be an art sector to reopen full stop. Brilliant, Brilliant. thanks Paul for that. A really great insight um, onto the whole sort of mess of the theatre world now, which <laughs> we've certainly been talking quite a lot about. Um, so we were wondering, um, uh, whilst for the workers of theatre is growing even more precarious, the actual participants of theatre now are sort of reaping the benefits in all of the um, screenings, the sort of free screenings of the plays that have been um, performed and were yet to, pop, um, to be performed before the closing of the theatres. So, um, so like the National Theatre and the screening, um, the, the rest of the, um, the houses that are sort of screening their work online. How do we make sure uh, that the workers get a fair slice rather than just letting these institutions appear as doing social good um, off the back of a hell of a lot of work by the theatre workers to get to that point? Um, it's, it's a really, really good question. And I think that the kind of um, digital exploitation um, online exploitation of work is is going is, is for the next few months going to be a big crisis and it is a balance it's a balance between propaganda for the sector that allows us to reopen and gets us in people's minds that you know shows how key and critical the arts are not only for the economy but also for society and making sure that we we, we accept you know um all, 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 all working people um are artists um but all artists are working people too and making sure that 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 is respected well in the case of the national theatre you mentioned that there is a there is a payment being made that's something that we've managed to um, negotiate in a way that actually compared to the donations that they're receiving is 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 in is in excess of the proportion that would normally be paid out we're making anything that's broadcast in a more conventional way including on more modern streaming services the union has been phenomenally successful in getting collective agreements with netflix with the only um, performers union in the world that has an agreement with Netflix and um, that means that there are industry standard rates to make sure that when that level of exploitation happens um, we are you know, it, it is the workers who are benefiting from it in a, in a collectively bargained way on a more localized level it is frankly more problematic and it's more problematic in part because of the of the willingness of artists to keep these institutions that they love and whose missions that they love um, open and accessible. And, and, and I think that, that, that actually what it requires is the initial crisis to, to cool as we provide the, the necessary propaganda for the sector to show our importance and, and show that social solidarity with people. But actually, as we go, as, as, as time pushes by, we, 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 we're very, very clear that, that where, um, where, what is the point in keeping these institutions open if those institutions are not making some form of contribution to our members. So once the initial crisis has passed, what is the new model? And we're all still feeling our way around what good collectively bargain solutions um, for broadcast theatre looks like. Um, but you know, we have models with, with Netflix, we have models with stuff that goes into uh, cinemas through NT Live and so on, which are very generous royalty models for um, theatre makers. And it's pushing things back into that collective agreement box as we've got over that initial um, sort of COVID crisis. Paul, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think, unfortunately, I'm desperate to take a couple more questions, but I think, unfortunately, we, for time, um, we're going to have to um, leave it there. I wonder if we can just really quickly, I'm probably going to get told off, but um, if you can, a uh, big fan of your manifesto that you've been, um, that you've been talking about uh, recently, I just wondered if you could maybe mention a couple of things um, from that um, in your kind of uh, campaign to become Equity's next General Secretary? 
Um, to, to, to keep it brief, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the the um, the website in the chat box so you can see the sort of full um, manifesto that's there. But essentially what it is, it's about trying to shift the union into a model that's about grassroots activism being as, as well supported as possible, making sure that we're as responsive to people's lived experience as artists as we possibly can be. Um, and that includes um, a more radical equalities agenda that's driven um, by the membership. That includes coming out of the COVID crisis, leading the industry. So that's the workers, the artists leading the industry as to what the response is. That is stuff like the five day working week. That is something like guarantees of 50-50 um, women's representation at least um, and penalties for employers in collective agreements if they don't meet that. That has to be part um, of our vision and reforming our own internal democratic structures that currently exclude an awful lot of grassroots artists, independent artists in particular. You know, I, I look after independent commercial dancers who you know, face very many you know, particular challenges. So refreshing our variety structure, which is what we call independent um, artists very often with a new conference um, a, a, a type set up specifically focusing on those needs of people who are more traditionally freelance. It's about reorienting ourselves to, towards the most precarious um, members um, while still protecting and maintaining and improving, modernizing those terms and conditions for every single member, no matter where they're working. I think the key bit that we have to focus on is terms and conditions for all. Minimum pay is one thing, but those terms and conditions elsewhere levels of holiday, levels of pension, the work-life balance, provisions for carers, that has to be part of our core purpose as a union, um, which it never has been before. And, and, and you know, that, that's, that's what I'm really, really keen on. But I'll put the link in the box. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Paul, that's quality. We've also had a few questions. I don't know if you can maybe answer in the chat, goes for other speakers as well, um, but um, particularly on UBI, um, people have been sort of quite interested in that, Tanya and Alex and, and people have, have mentioned it. But yeah, thanks so much and best of luck with the campaign as well. Cheers, Paul. Um, so yeah, just before we move on to our next speaker, we'd just like to share something really quickly with you. In the general election, Momentum launched mycampaignmap.com. I'm sure many of you used it. It was a digital tool that let you know which constituencies needed your help the most. So now Momentum have repurposed the map for the fight against coronavirus. Head to volunteercoronavirus.com, tap in your postcode, and you'll be able to find and join Facebook and WhatsApp groups with people supporting each other in your area. Um, it's a really quality tool and a great way to repurpose it. Uh, there's also been a, a live streams feature added to the site so you can see all the live streams we and others are running over the next few weeks. We'll be updating this over the coming days and weeks. So yeah, check it out now. It should be uh, posted just in the chat. So that's volunteercoronavirus.com. Um, so now onto our next speakers. We're lucky to have not one, not two, but three <laughs> representatives, uh, Chris, Anna and Anahi from the United Voices of the World, the UVW's uh, newly formed designers and uh, cultural workers branch. Um, delighted to have you on the call as well. Thank you so much. Obviously, because there's three of you, we're quite tight for time on, <laughs> on this. So it will be like a quick sort of um, passing the bat on. Um, but yeah, we're going to be hearing more about how the branch is winning demands and also about their studio rent freeze campaign. So, um, Chris, I think you're you're speaking first, aren't you? Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. So, yeah. Um, could you Tell us a bit more about, about what the UVW is doing specifically in response to the precariousness of art sector workers during lockdown and also some insight into specific campaigns you're, you're launching during this, this time. Yeah, um, if you could help with timekeeping as well, because obviously we've got three speakers. Um, I'll just kind of give a quick overview of the union. I think Anahi and Anna are going to kind of talk a bit more about recent campaigns. Amazing. Um, so first, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to the World Transformed and all the speakers. Um, today and like everyone who's kind of joining this call, um, feel really lucky to be a part of this conversation. Um, so quickly introduce myself, I'm Chris, I'm an organizer um, and member of UVW's branch designers plus cultural workers. So I work as a graphic designer and a lecturer. So I guess the important thing is that we're kind of um, unprofessional organizers in some, some degree, we're kind of workers first and we've kind of come to UVW's um, to kind of learn more about kind of workplace organizing. So um, kind of some statements around our industry, which is kind of all um, obviously more apparent now since COVID, but our industry is young. So there's a kind of constant rhetoric of youth and speed. So kind of acceleration of production, kind of small timescales. So this rhetoric of youth is constantly used to frame our industry, but our industry is also young because it's still emerging. So this is kind of advantageous as it makes change quite possible. So our workforce is atomized. So we often have no specific site of work, um, which obviously makes kind of workplace organizing slightly more difficult. 
Um, plus there's a, a kind of culture of rampant individualization. Our workplace is unequal, so there's underrepresentation along class, race, gender, and disability lines. Plus there's high levels of income inequality. So even, I don't know if people have been watching what's happening in America with some of the large cultural institutions like uh, MoMA, what kind of Glenn Lowry's salary is versus kind of uh, the freelancers who have all recently been laid off. So um, our labor is undervalued, 90% of internships in the arts are still unpaid um, and there's rampant unpaid overtime. There's a culture of overwork, which obviously was mentioned in the previous call. Um, and our sector is held together by favors and opportunities and our employment is unstable. So as people have spoken before, it's casualized, temporary, calendar specific. It's on a project basis or we're interns or on zero hour contracts or have no contracts. We're outsourced and we have little securities like pensions. Um, so to give a little overview of our branch, um, our membership represents a cross section of the creative industries. So it's open to anyone identifying as a designer and or cultural worker. So we recognize that people often work multiple jobs, some of which are not considered creative. Um, we have members who work in theater and performance, fashion, publishing, graphic design, artists, curators, people working in art schools and arts admin. And so our branch organically evolved out of UBW, which I'm not sure people kind of um, know the histories of UBW. We can go into it a little bit later if there's time. Um, but UBW is kind of a non-sector specific union. Um, so some of us are already members of it. Um, and the branches, which are kind of still emerging kind of organically um, started kind of coalescing around UBW. So it's an opportunity to kind of um, network different sectors that are kind of precarious as well in their organization to UBW main. And so um, that kind of, we kind of have or we kind of lead autonomously through the branches but we take inspiration solidarity experience and counsel and support from UVW so we were inspired um, to kind of join UVW and form our branch um, through this kind of new emerging grassroots union because they were already undertaking and already undertaking the work to combat modern forms of exploitative work um, so we kind of saw more overlap with fellow precarious workers that were outsourced and gig economy workers um, and therefore we thought we kind of had more to learn and more to gain from this new union movement um, so some of the first workers that UBW represented were cleaners at the Barbican. So our branch recognizes that all forms of cultural production equal cultural workers. So galleries and museums don't function without cleaners, porters and security staff. They facilitate cultural production, but are more often not afforded even basic rights due to outsourcing and casualized practices. Organizing in our branch within UBW offered a framework to both acknowledge and make visible the realities of being an art worker. So we're kind of we're non-traditional in many senses. So UBW is known for being a fighting union and also for winning. It's a mem members led agile and predominantly represents migrant workers. So um, it's in Spanish and English. Those are the two languages of the union. Um, and for the first time as well, it's unionizing sectors that have been historically underrepresented. So cleaners, sex workers, architectural workers, people that work in violence against women charity sector and legal sector workers. So those are the other branches that are kind of emerging now. And our branch tries to keep the boundary between member and organizer as porous as possible. So any member that joins can be an organizer. We have roles that are shared and that they're rotational um, and we're shaped in a kind of ad hoc way to respond to our members' concerns and emerging issues. We use sociocracy as a way to facilitate meetings and output. So aiming for consent rather than consensus. And we're trying to have as many voices and faces as possible representing our branch, which is why there's three of us today. Um, we use Discord to organize our branch, which is kind of an online platform. We have different channels created for working groups and different roles. So members and organizers can kind of see as kind of a transparent organizing that's happening. Um, and we try as much as possible to kind of avoid WhatsApp for kind of members and organizers' mental health. Um, in our current climate, we kind of use video calls like this and Discord voice channels and chats to organize. And in response to the current crisis, we've been trying to map the experiences of our members in our sector. So most notably studio spaces, as we felt this is an area that a lot of organizers might not be focused on at the given moment. Um, because there's obviously so much bad practice happening elsewhere. So Anna and Anahi will introduce that in a minute, but um, we've also kind of been supported by our legal, legal sector sister branch who have helped kind of co-organize um, Q&A sessions and kind of member support, um, kind of going through the various furlough schemes. So I guess in terms of COVID, um, we're really concerned because there's many culture workers that have fallen through the net of government in income support. So obviously huge numbers of culture workers, which have been mentioned already, won't be properly contracted or will be contracted on a temporary basis. So it makes the furlough schemes inaccessible. And the self-employment scheme will only land in June. So for many of us, this is too late. We have very little savings, but bills still to pay. The scheme also takes gross profit. So the designers and culture workers will have large expenses like studio rent and equipment. Um, so they'll kind of see very little financial support um, when it's calculated on their, on their um, total profit. So this is not to mention that this is only accessible to those earning more than 50% of their income from being self-employed. So this will obviously exclude many who kind of um, navigate a precarious network of various different um, jobs and workplaces. 
So universal credit is, is kind of the only option for many art workers, um, but obviously if I wait to receive the first installments, it's not good enough. Um, um, and the arts can't be that lame time guy as well. Um, okay. But, but just so we can fit in um, um, the other speakers from UVW, but uh, that's quality. Also just to slip in a really quick question as well um, from Teresa Easton, just to ask, is UVW just based in London or do you have branches up north as well? There seems to be like loads of interest. Yeah, so we've been we've had people contact us from other parts of the UK. So yeah, we kind of um, would like to kind of have sister branches across the UK. But again, because it's member led, it would be like a conversation yeah with those that want to kind of organise and we can provide support. And yeah, kind of um, I think for our architectural branch, they've already opened one in Manchester. So yeah, we'd be totally looking uh, to kind of network beyond London as well. I just wanted to make one last point just on the Arts Council because it was kind of mentioned earlier. Um, so in terms of income support schemes for artists, um, the Arts Council and the Ministry Support Scheme, although it was obviously very welcome, it's inaccessible for many. So not only it's because of increased competition, because you can kind of see that their website was already down within a few hours of opening, but also restricting applicants to those whose artistic practice accounts are more than 50% of total earnings. So that excludes those already marginalized by our sector, um, again, along race, disability, gender, and class lines. And it also damagingly re-identifies them as non-artists. Okay, I'll pass over. Amazing. Thanks so much, Chris. That was brilliant. Thanks. Um have we got um is Anahi on the call as well? I think Anahi's next. Oh, oh we've got Anna next. Okay, brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> no I'll worries. quickly start. I'll quickly start on um so first I'll introduce myself. My name is Anna and um I work in the fashion sector. I'm a freelance textile designer, um, but I also work as front of house staff in an independent cinema. Um so we wanted to tell you about uh, our studio campaign. It's hard to call it a rent strike or a rent freeze campaign yet. It's a bit of a work in progress campaign. Um, it's been one of our main focuses lately as, as a union. Um, so we decided to focus on this quite early on. Um, actually like the minute our income vanished and the minute our rent was due, which was really early on. Um, the first package announced by the government miss, missed the self-employed workers. This caused great worry amongst us as all our projects were being canceled one by one with no alternative means of support. It was rectified a week later with the announcement of the self-employment income support scheme, but the scheme does not go far enough. As Chris said, many of us fall between the cracks. Money isn't available until June. And, to, and those that will be able to claim the grant will be receiving 80% of their taxable income. So the grant doesn't actually cover our usual expenses such as um, our, our rent for our studios. Um, um, we also are anticipating that the loss of income will last. So we believe a rent freeze is necessary in the face of months worth of lost income and we're um, anticipating very difficult time to come work isn't going to pick up overnight. Cultural institutions will be closed for a long time. Intense usual periods of work are coming like summer um, where there's many gigs, fairs, fashion weeks. Um, this is a time where self-employed workers generate a lot of their yearly income. Um, and the thing we realized and made us want to address the studio issue is the government guidelines were really too vague. So government was sending confusing messages on staying at home to save lives, but also keep the economy going. Uh, ambiguous messages on work from home. So the government states that anyone who cannot work from home can still go to work. So that's really difficult to interpret for artists, self-employed designers who have their own studios. Also the speech around accessing studios um, is a bit um, problematic. Like artists need to access, the, access their studios for their own mental health, um, but really, um, we think it's that studio holders don't want to shut to be given more reasons to cancel rent. Um, so we created a survey that we sent out to our members because we thought it was really important to understand how organizations have responded, seeing how vague the government guidelines were. Um, we received really inconsistent uh, responses. So there's um, Many studio providers that have announced rent holidays, yes, and emergency funds, um, but uh, most tenants are calling for further support. Emergency funds are often really small and only a few are encouraged to apply. And then rent holidays um, are not, uh, do not cancel rent. They're only increase the anxiety of a growing debt. Um, then, other providers are also going ahead with rent increases, threatening tenants with fees for not paying 
bills charging high interest rates for late payments with absolutely no warning. And in general, there's been like very bad or minimal communication between uh, studio providers and their studio holders. Um, so this led to um, a creation of a database where we've um, publicly listed all the different practices. Um, we'll post a link on the chat. We also put together a best practice guideline for studio providers, which was sent out to many providers across the UK. Um, in that guideline, our key demands are closure of all studio spaces to all but essential work. This might be controversial. Um, maybe except more individual studios where people don't have to pass by uh, many people on their way. But as we know in London, a lot of studios are overcrowded. Um, so just, yeah, we want... Um, Sorry to be that time guy again. Okay, I'm almost <laughs> done. We want a more frequent cleaning um, where you're stressing the need for rent suspension, not a holiday, no rent increases, no evictions, and more transparency. Okay, I'll pass over to Anai. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so if we can get Anai up now. Um, also, just to, just to say as well, we're not going to have time um, for follow-up questions on here, but if we can have um, follow-up questions posted in the chat, and then um, I think the speakers will be able to try and answer them there and, and get in touch. Um, Anai, are you there? Oh yeah, great. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. So my name's Anai and I work in a visual arts department at a cultural institution in London. Um, so I'll keep it really brief because um, they've gone into quite a lot as well already. So I think after we basically sent out um, our studio survey and obviously after sending out the letter, it became really clear that um, there is a really wide diversity of types of studios that we're working with so whether it's bigger style studios with hundreds of tenants to small scale studios and even studios that function as charities it, you know it's clear that this is not like a we can't catch them all with one single solution um, and so that's something we're going to have to do some thinking about um, and I think it's become also really clear that it's necessary to have a an overview of the legal landscape of the studio's tenancies to work out what we can do and what actions we can actually legally take and what we can collaborate on others with. And this is something that the UVW lawyers branch has been really helpful with as they've been helping us with questions and hosting Q and A's. Um, I mean, I think as you can tell, and this is cool kind of illustrate, this is a super quickly changing um, situation. So it's been really difficult to pin down providers and also get a good idea of what's going on because things are changing day by day and we're getting emails every day with new information. But I think one of their biggest takeaways has been that there is um, regional differences. So in London, studios are being by hard by far the harshest with their tenants, um, whereas regionally they might be more flexible. And I think this is kind of seen in the fact that only 13% of organizations providing artist workspaces actually own their own spaces. So that makes um, art spaces particularly vulnerable to you know, eviction or closure. Um, regionally, kind of more widely in the UK, we've heard from our members that there is a wider variety of studio models where artists are more involved and actually invited into the conversation, which may have been the case in London or may be the case in some smaller studios, but for the large part, kind of studios in London um, are not grassroots or membership run, um, and the relationship tends to be quite tenant to landlord. Um, and, you know, this is kind of has led us to collaborate with Rent Strike and the London Renters Union because we think this really reflects the state of a wide kind of ecology of real estate and um, property landscape in London, where many tenants are living paycheck to paycheck um, with risk of closure, you know, at a month's notice. So this, you know, links us to further tenants across London, but also shops and smaller businesses. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about agility, we're also trying to have shorter term solutions, because obviously this is a campaign that could lead us down like a kind of a longer road. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, reply to the people that are getting in touch to us and think about how we can create resources for tenants want to get in touch with their um you know with their studio providers and um we're thinking about how we can provide studio support and also bring artists in i think because you know ultimately dcw is a member-led organization so i think as artists reach out to us we're going to try to um make them a part of the campaign and a part of the solution you know it's been really clear that um there's been lots of solidarity across tenants um, already. So, you know, that's already a key part in our organizing. So as far as we're able to involve them in the solution, um, that's something that we'll be doing. And, you know, because it is similar to how our union works. Um, I think this is an incredible opportunity to reframe how our industry is, is shaped and how it's structured. And we really wanna see how far we can take that um, through through this project and through this campaign. Um, yeah, so I, have, I kept it really brief. Um, so please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, and if this sounds 
sounds interesting to you, we'll post a link to UBW or maybe or someone already has. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to hear from anyone. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant, thank you, Anay, that was great. Um, and Chris and Anna, um, and full solidarity with the Rent Freeze campaign, that sounds really brilliant. Um, okay, we're running a bit late, but um, on to our final speaker today. We're really excited about another international speaker, and we have Dana Roo, who is a DJ, producer, and also runs KMA60 Record Store in Berlin. Dana, welcome, can you hear us? We can see you. Okay. Hurrah. Brilliant. And um, can you tell us more about your experience of how the coronavirus is affecting your work and also Berlin's thriving nightlife and music scene? Yeah, that is pretty hard, I have to say, because we are all in the same boat, let's say like this. Uh, when, when the whole thing started, of course, all the gigs are cancelled and it goes really till August, September. We don't even know that. And this is just one thing that happened to us because uh, it's also as a record store owner, the, the whole industry suffers from everything. It's not just about the artists and everything, you know, because it's an economic cycle, let's say it like this, because uh, certain artists have records in the pipeline. They don't even know, should they release it right now? From my talks with the distributions, everybody is pretty unsure how to behave or what can they do right now what, what's when do we start again still some records come out uh, because they are in production and of course you know they, they have to be in the shops but then the records come out but nobody can really i mean you can play it in a stream but that's not the same so right now you're you're releasing all these records with your music but you have not the experience with the clubs that the circle is really very difficult and i see now there is still a flow of records that come out and but we can't play it but uh, how long does this last and at some point i even with the with the record store it's pretty difficult because from 100 to zero i have no income uh, i'm responsible for the shop i have people i'm working with there's a lot of responsibility also i don't know it's it's a very confusing situation we don't have enough information but i have to say uh, in germany we are really blessed yeah because the state takes a uh, responsibility they offered already some things they offered money they really try to support us but yeah we, it would be good to understand how long the situation takes because take because it's 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 just weird it's, it's very confusing very weird and not really if i speak from myself it's not very it's not helping the creativity also <laughs> Dana, thank you. Um, what? Uh, yeah, just thinking about um, how how that relates to um, lots of our kind of cultural institutions and and the way that these are these are functioning now. Also, if anyone um, has any questions, please please post in the chat. Um, what do you think the the future looks like for um, the nightlife in in Berlin? And is there any sign of how this might um, kind of uh, develop when, uh, like Paul Fleming was talking about before, when reopening then starts again? I mean, the, the state, uh, they have uh, promised financial help for clubs and everything. So this is, this is something, but again, the clubs, they have stuff they have to pay there are, there are certain things if you do the calculations i don't know how long this money lasts but of course there will people there will be people they will survive and there will be people they maybe don't i don't i don't know it depends on how how much depends on them i, I mean from a, from a positive point of view it can be healthy because it cleans a bit the situation and also maybe people come or the clubs come back to the local artists and maybe this is something very interesting because you have a lot of quality around Berlin, a lot of quality of artists that are not so big because you know they're maybe a bit nerdy, they are super into music, they are not so skilled of using the social medias and everything, but we have a lot of quality here and that is also a, a chance, you know, to let them shine and maybe, you know, we, 
we go back, remember the roots or whatever, and then we 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 start to shine again, and we ha we can present artists that uh, they they have a chance right now. So you know what what I what I mean. It's not just about the big names. It's a uh, it's about in general of being able to come back together as a community and to to provide a certain quality, which I think, to be honest, uh, in the last years was a bit lacking because no that's just my personal opinion but this is how i see it <laughs> uh dana we've had a question in the chat um yeah. that with someone's wondering is the government money enough in germany for artists are you finding is that uh, sort of close to it? the money that we got right now is a is a good help we have opportunities if it is enough depends on how long the situation lasts and even if there is a they open everything again and we can start but it takes a bit time to get back in the business it's not that we that it's from now to 100 percent. it's just not possible it's a slowly building up the things also we have to be realistic what can the clubs spend right now we have to really think about this the promoters can they survive what can they really do what uh, financial support and i think we really have to work quite close together and really be realistic and build it up really together it is not about the big fees and everybody should come down a bit and just take it as an opportunity to, you know, to stick together and build something up together because it's important. If we want to really have fun and we want to stick together, we have to build it up together. And there is nothing that uh, it's just not possible, you know, high fees, we have to be realistic after that. It, it, and this is what I think is a positive point. You know, it can be a cleaning from all this craziness and late, lately that was just blown up in a way. Maybe that's that could be something. I don't know, we will see it, we will see it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that as well. I think we've got a few more questions in the chat as well, but um, if you wouldn't mind um, answering those um, in the chat, just because um, I'm aware that we've sort of uh, overrun a little bit. We're also going to be um, playing out with some of uh, Dana's music at the end of the call, so mm -hmm. look forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, it's, but it's really fascinating to hear how varied governments have, have responded um, in uh, trying to help artists and and kind of keep these sectors alive and working. Um, so yeah, we're just nearly at the end of the call now, just a few more things. Firstly, just wanted to remind everyone to look after yourselves, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, as, as James Butler says on, um, uh, wait, what's it called? On the burner, that was <laughs> it. Um, yeah, wash your hands and don't be a, a, a bad person. <laughs> Um, the prospect of being in our homes all the time can be really frightening for loads of people um, and we need to act as a community to show solidarity and to look after each other. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear on this. Oh yeah. I think um, all the bets are well fine, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, but as TWT, just thinking about the burner, it doesn't matter, but go and listen to the burner, it's really good. Um, as TWT, we're going to try to organise as many online spaces for people to interact as possible. Um, We've just created a step-by-step -step guide for supporting people to run political education and organizing meetings online. Um, the solidarity that we can show in the community that we can build right now, I think is absolutely essential for, for all of us. Um, and we're just gonna post the links in the chat right now. We've also got um, two political education courses launching this week. Um, tomorrow at 6.30, we're launching our Abolitionist Futures Reading Group to discuss how coronavirus is exposing some of the ideas that underpin our justice system. Uh, the history of prison abolition and reform and how we can build a world without prisons and how to organize your own prison abolition reading group with your friends and community. And then on Thursday at 8 p.m. we're launching the first of a fortnightly webinar series on a history of socialists within and outside of the Labour Party from 1945 to today uh, and that's called Searching for Socialism the Spirit of 1945 and those links should be posted in the chat right now i'm aware the chat's being kind of bombarded a little bit but um hopefully you can see that because dan usually posts them loads and loads of times so dan yeah. who's just told us that we're not allowed to swear just for clarification oh, good. Oh, it's a good job I didn't. <laughs> um, That's good. Uh, please keep an eye out for reading groups and other kinds of political education organizing meetings and of course tune into this call at the same time next week um to stay up to date with all of these initiatives uh please sign up to our mailing list the link is also in the chat um, um and that is bit.ly slash TWT join. Uh, it should be in the chat, but that's easy. bit.ly slash TWT join. 
Um, and finally, if you're able to, please do join the TWT Supporters Network. Political education on the left is more important than ever, and the crisis poses a real risk to small organisations like us. So um, go to bit.ly slash support TWT. Um, find the link. We'll have reposted it in the chat just now. Um, if you can give, you can give as little as one pound a month, I think it is, um, or you could do like 50 pounds a month, as Nora said before as well. And anything is appreciated um, to keep us going, especially uh, in this time. So cheers. Right, next week we're back again discussing healthcare uh, with some very special guest speakers from the UK and beyond. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements in the coming days. Thanks so much for everyone um, who tuned in and a huge thanks, and for all our speakers as well, who are brilliant. Huge thanks to Dan for running the tech for us uh, and a big thanks to Jess Adams for helping organize. And the hugest thanks to Sarah Voden, who's done so much work to make this call happen. Legend. Um, and is hiding somewhere in one of the little <laughs> boxes. Uh, now we're gonna play you out with some of Dana's new tracks. Take it away, Dan. Cheers, Dan. Thanks everyone. Bye.